Okay, so this is a, a presentation on Stalinism, but more particularly what my just published book on it called Stalinism and the Dialectics of Saturn, subtitled Anti-Communism, Marxism, and the Fate of the Soviet Union. And I think I should just kind of uh, tell you where the title actually comes from. It comes from an adage from Greco-Roman mythology about the god Saturn, who ate his children lest they overthrow him. And this was adopted as an adage by a lot of conservatives, liberals, moderates uh, during the French Revolution of 1789, which had a reign of terror and ended with Napoleon. And one revolutionary named George Staunton actually said the revolution is like Saturn, it devours its children. And this idea of revolutions eating their own was actually repeated by conservatives to the Russian Revolution and subsequent revolutions in China, etc. And for them, it's, it was an adage, you know, revolutions will not liberate humanity, will just end with a new breed of oppressors and ruin and totalitarianism, etc. And if you even look at the Russian Revolution, it almost seems like there's a lot of the same players in the game. You know, you have a, a really imbecile monarch in both cases. You have revolution like fervent revolutionaries like Robespierre and Lenin, uh, great orators like Danton and Trotsky. Um, you have also the tyrants who appear like Napoleon and, um, and Stalin. So this question of our revolutions doomed to devour their children is not just some historical interest. It also has contemporary meaning because if every form of revolution is going to end in ruin and tyranny or Stalinism in the case of a proletarian revolution, then our prospects of actually have it reaching communism become kind of bleak. Well, to understand Stalinism, I adopted um, the perspective that Marx has in his book, The 18th Brumaire. And in the preface, he says that, well, first of all, this is about the rise to power in France of this mediocrity, uh, Emperor Napoleon III who wasn't quite like his uncle, who was a great general at the very least. Um, but this mediocrity, and Marx says, you know, there were three views of Napoleon. There were those who saw him like Victor Hugo as a bolt from the blue, this kind of, you know, demonic figure who just kind of appeared out of nowhere. Then there were those who kind of celebrated his rise, like uh, Proudhon, who saw him as this savior, this instrument of historical necessity. And Marx says that he's differentiating his view as the historical materialist view, the viewing of the material circumstances in the class struggle that allow us to see how Napoleon rose. And if you apply this to Stalinism, you see essentially three different camps, both from the blue, uh, historical necessity, and the materialist class analysis approach. In terms of the bolt from the blue, there are three main I identify three main perspectives. The first is the virus. And if you go to the French Revolution, reactionaries saw it not as the cause of the people oppressed rising up or the contradictions of feudal society. They saw it as a virus caused by enlightenment reason. And so it was that. And by the 19th century, when you start to see the rise of the proletariat and the development of modern medicine, they see this virus as biological. And they, they have a name for it. It's called the Jew. The Jew is this international agent of disillusion of society of the nation. It is the cause of communism and proletarian revolution. And Winston Churchill probably best exemplified the mainstream view of, of, the, of communism as a Jewish Bolshevik virus. He saw it had no rational basis. Uh, it had no material basis in society. It was just these insidious Jews who were destroying all nations and were stopping their life force. Now, some will say, you know, Churchill was not quite an anti-Semite because he liked Jews who were loyal to the nation. He liked Zionist Jews, but he really hated internationalist Jews. And he saw a long conspiracy going all the way back to the Illuminati. And he was, he, he detested uh Jews in the leadership of the Bolshevik party, such as Leon Trotsky. He celebrated the purges. Um, he thought it was, you know, purging of the internationalist Jews and the replacement by Russian nationalists. And he saw fascists like Mussolini as providing a bulwark of the healthy elements of the nation against the Judeo-Bolshevik virus. Now, 
you do see obviously a much more genocidal version of this in Adolf Hitler, the founder of National Socialism. And he thought the Jews ruled the Soviet Union, that they were in a life and death struggle with the Aryan race. And for Hitler and the National Socialists, Jew and communists were practically synonymous, which is why the war on the Eastern Front was waged much differently than the war against France or Belgium, but it's a genocidal, ideological, racial crusade to annihilate the Jews and Bolshevism. There is also a more modern kind of um, what we would call subdued um, Judeo-Bolshevik view, and that is represented by someone uh, who we, you may know as Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who wrote the Gulag Archipelago. He is sometimes not quite as explicit, but he'll identify, well, look at all these Jews in the leadership, and look at these bad Jews, like the diabolical genius of Trotsky, you know, these Jews who are quite alien to Russia. And some will say it was spiritual, not a racial anti-Semitism, although it's kind of what we would call a distinction without a difference. But for them, um, Communism, in all its varieties, has no rational basis. It has no material roots in society. It is something insidious. It is a Jewish Bolshevik contagion that must be combated by any means necessary. There is now that is the more far right version of the bolt from the blue. The more left wing version is Big Brother. That's from uh, George Orwell. Orwell, um, despite that he did identify as a socialist, was never a Marxist. He never supported Bolshevism. If you read his letters, he said, you know, it was pretty much bad from the beginning. He didn't really differentiate super much between Trotsky and Stalin. He thought Trotsky is a bit more interesting, but that's about it. And if you read Orwell's writings, like his reportage on the working class in England and, in, and in, during his time in the Spanish Civil War, he, he, he is a vivid writer. He's a wonderful writer. He can describe things. But if you actually deep, dig deep into it, he really doesn't care about analyzing things in like a deep theoretical level. His book, Wigan Pier, which is about the working class in England, it's not like Engels' work, book on the working class in England. Engels is very clearly looking at the class contradictions of society and what is going to lead to proletarian revolution, what you need. Orwell doesn't do that. He's like, you know, we just need to fight for the common decency. That's all you really need to know. None of this dialectic materialist stuff. And his book on the Spanish Civil War gets some important things right about, you know, the, the suppression of the anarchists and the poom during the May Days. But he really doesn't care about the political differences or the causes of the war. He can't really explain them. He doesn't even get the military policy of the militia he served with right. He thinks that they were anarchists when they actually proposed the Red Army. So he doesn't understand that. So Orwell is very good at getting this... Um, surface level view, but nothing really deeper than that when it comes to understanding communism. And he really, so he can understand the propaganda, the cruelty, etc. but that's really all he thinks it is. He thinks it's a lust for power's sake, people who are being inherently cruel. And this becomes more pronounced at, at, during World War II, because he had a brief period after the Spanish Civil War where he hated the popular front, he wanted to be a revolutionary, but he never became a Marxist. But during the war, he actually adopted his own version of patriotic socialism, which is kind of funny, where he thought British socialism wouldn't abolish the monarchy. So I guess he'd be fine with the current coronation, etc. But it would, you know, it would institute all these reforms. And his views like Animal Farm is like an, an example of his of this view that revolutions are going to end up bad. You know, the animals liberate, but they end up being the new humans, the new oppressors. And it becomes like, it reaches its fullest form in 1984. And I should add that Orwell by this point is very pessimistic. He still is identifying as a socialist, but it's very clear that he, he actually says in his letters, I side with America in any conflict. That he's willing to give, you know, to give names of potential subversives to British uh, police agencies. That's not made up. That's true. And in 1984, he sees the prospect of this totalitarian menace that he calls Big Brother dominating society forever, a boot stamping on the human face forever. And he sees no escape from it. And even if it was not quite his intent to produce an anti communist work to discredit all socialism, it certainly has that effect, and it's pretty much one of the staples. But he thinks that these that revolutions will, will are led by people with a lust for power, 
there is no ideas that it's just Nietzsche that it's just Nietzsche and Superman who want to dominate and oppress people for the sake of it. Now, the mainstream version of the Bolt from the Blue is something that had emerged during the Cold War, and it's called totalitarianism, or what I would call the counter-enlightenment. Now, totalitarianism before the Cold War was a very diffuse idea. Everyone was kind of using it. Mussolini used it to describe himself. Churchill used it to describe Stalin and Hitler. Trotsky used it. Other people uh, on the Marxist left used it. But it's all kind of up in the air, and it changes its form. During World War II, you would see people use it, but only to describe Nazi Germany, not to describe the Soviet Union. But this changes in 1945 because the Cold War happens, and for the United States and the Western imperialists, the Soviet Union is the new enemy, and they need to uh, explain this enemy to their society. And it's, it's interesting to note, before 1945, there was no such thing in colleges as Russian or Soviet studies. Afterwards, there's a big funding effort by the government, by businesses, to fund Soviet studies throughout uh, American academia. Any critical scholars are purged, and, and they produce this new theories of, to understand the communist enemy, to serve, you know, to discredit revolution, to look at the Soviet Union as this diabolical heir to Adolf Hitler that is planning to conquer the world. And the linchpin of their theory is totalitarianism. And totalitarianism is not just an authoritarian government. It is this all-encompassing rule of like a single dictator or party that wants to control all aspects of society. That once they are in power, they institute a reign of terror, permanent and unending, and that they want to dominate not just men's bodies, but their souls and minds as well. And that communism is on a path for world domination. Now, you may think, why am I talking about communism and not Stalinism? Because none of the totalitarians make these distinctions. They do not note a difference between Leninism, Trotskyism, Stalinism, et cetera, et cetera. There's a very simple narrative that in Lenin and sometimes Marx, depending on which one you talk to, that there is this germ for domination, that the party will, you know, is, is this elitist group that is going to dominate and manipulate workers with demagogues, that the 1917 revolution was a coup d'etat, it had no popular support, and that totalitarianism finally, it had this early dry run with Lenin, but finally under Stalin in the 30s and the 40s, it becomes fully full-blown, and it plans to conquer the world and institute a reign of heathen and godlessness to conquer, to wipe out everyone. I should say that totalitarianism provides, it is not a theory of history or society, the idea of a society frozen in a permanent state of total control and terror is just, it is antithetical to any progress, uh, idea of historical change and development. It's undialectical to use that phrase. And there were challenges to it um, by the 60s with the, the you know, the, uh, the movements then. There was a whole revisionist school of Soviet historiography. I'm not going to go into it. People like uh, Sheila Fitzpatrick, J. R. Chietti, Alexander Rabanovich, uh, Robert Tucker, Stephen Cohen, all these type of people, they basically said, listen, Soviet societies were not frozen. There was actually alternatives there. Because if you listen to the totalitarians, the only difference between Stalin and Trotsky is that Stalin was just more power hungry and better at getting power. That there was obviously no ideas between them. But these people were interested in alternatives. Most of them looked to Nikolai Bukharin, who was a, of the right opposition in the Soviet party, but some of whom, but they were, they were very interested in the, these different ideas and programs. But by the 60s, um, the, it's, the, the whole totalitarian school kind of like reemerges. And this, they, because initially they're kind of have this own diversity in them. Some of them look to modern societies causing totalitarianism. Some of them go all the way back to Plato. And some of which look, look kindly on reformist Marxists and even the French Revolution. But with someone named Jacob Talman, he basically says, listen, totalitarianism. Bolshevism, communism has its roots in the radical ideas of the Enlightenment. They had their dry run in the French Revolution with the Jacobins. 
And this idea of totalitarian democracy, of totally remaking society, that man can actually comprehend the world and change it is completely dangerous. And it, it achieves its full flowering with communism, with Marx, with Lenin and Trotsky and Stalin. So we have to, we can be enlightenment people, but moderates, but the enlightenment taken to its logical conclusion is dangerous. And this becomes part of the linchpin. Now he's not, Talman is not the first person to make this argument, but he's certainly the one who makes it very forcibly and does a lot of uh, scholarly research on it. And this, this idea of enlightenment reason, of rationally comprehending the world being the linchpin of totalitarianism becomes essentially the, the, the linchpin of the later counter-enlightenment project. And you see it in Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He, blend, he actually hates Western society be, for having materialist values for humanism. And Solzhenitsyn also presents this ultra-reactionary Christian critique of uh, the Soviet Union and communism. And he agrees with actually um, the current leaders of the Soviet Union that, listen, they are the heirs of, of Lenin and Stalin, that there was no alternative, that this is what you're going to get when you have this. And you have people like Francois Ferre, who say, uh, who was a French historian, and he wanted to discredit the idea that the, the French Revolution was a bourgeois revolution, that Jacobinism was a good thing and all this, because if he could do that, then he would discredit the idea that you would, that the proletarian revolution of 1917 was a historical heir. And before that man died, he was actually sl uh, slated to write the preface to the Black Book of Communism. And you have others like Leszek Kalakowski, who was a Polish anti-communist, and he wrote a massive book called um, The Main Currents of Marxism. And he basically said, listen, it's a folly because of human nature, because man has fallen, and that if you have this idea of rationally comprehending the world, of, of a Promethean change, it will destroy everything. And if you even see the totalitarian idea get um, of totalitarian twins of, of Hitler and Stalin take a really perverse turn with German revisionists like Ernst Nolte, who said, listen, the Bolsheviks started a civil war in Europe in 1917, and Nazism was the defensive response to the Holocaust and the invasion of, of the Soviet Union. That was necessary to stop Asiatic barbarism from overrunning Europe. Yes, they were totalitarian twins, but one of them was worse. And he also has this weird distinction of both saying the Holocaust was necessary but didn't happen. So it's kind of got that side going. And of course, you have people like Robert Conquest, who says the Soviet Union purposely targeted Ukrainians in a genocidal famine, although he kind of later said in a, a letter late in life, no, they actually didn't do that. And there's a lot of controversy around that. Uh, the Ukrainian famine, because clearly the Soviets had a kind of screwed up agricultural collective policy, but the idea that they were planning to annihilate the Ukrainians is really not supported, even by very anti-communist people like Stephen Kotkin, who he's kind of a reactionary bastard, but he wrote the book, uh, uh, he's writing a biography of Stalin, and he denies that. And the kind of culmination of this counter-enlightenment project is the, is the Black Book of Communism, where communism is a criminal enterprise. It is the worst uh, killer of people in human history, 100 million dead, and everything, you know, this idea of enlightenment reason, of Jacobinism as a dry run for Bolshevism is there. There are no alternatives, whether it's Stalin, Trotsky, Mao, Ceausescu, or whomever, they're all one in the same and it will all end that way. The thing with the Black Book of Communism is the some uh, the, the numbers were completely fudged. The victims do in actually include uh, coll uh, German collaborators on the Eastern Front. No differentiation is made between war and peace. People who are killed in like police operations or in counter-revolutionary or just people swept up in the purges. And even if those figures were true of 100 million, that kind of ignores the fact that capitalism has done far worse, two world wars, colonialism, famines in India and China, et cetera. So basically the point about this bolt from the blue is it cannot rationally comprehend communism. It cannot explain Stalinism at all. It is just meant to uh, defend private property, imperialism and social inequalities. And it has no use whatsoever in any discussion on communism. Now, from that, let's go a bit to the historical necessitarian view. And just to 
So as Marxists, we understand that society is governed by natural and social laws and that they can be understood by people, uh, that you know, we have the ability to do that. And Marxism provides that tool to understand all the laws that govern society, that freedom is the recognition of necessity, as Engels says, and that capitalism has a material tendency towards crises and breakdown, that the proletariat is the class that will liberate and that revolution is needed to get to communism. And for people in the communist parties themselves and the Western Marxists, they believe that Stalinism is basically the way to get there. So all the compromises that Stalinism makes, all the betrayals it makes, all the crimes, et cetera, and even the achievements, et cetera, is all historically necessary to reach communism. So for them, that there is no alternative to, you know, that any alternative is either wrong, it goes against the will of history, you know, such as Trotsky or Bukharin, if it's not demonic or, you know, treason to history, or it's just unrealistic. These are just dreamers who don't understand, like, how realistic Stalin was, and he knew what had to be done. And the... This idea of historical necessity was given great voice by the German author, Arthur Kessler, who was originally a member of the German Communist Party. He left it during the purge trials in the Spanish Civil War. And he wrote a book called Darkness at Noon, which does it's about the Moscow trials and it really doesn't, exp it's, it's a fiction work. And the character is basically an old Bolshevik. He's a composite character. And he's charged with treason to the country and the revolution. And he knows it's a fake, but at the end, sorry to spoil the book, but he confesses to the crime because he's like, it is for the will of history. You know, I need to do this last service for the revolution and my confession, even if it debases my life and my soul will serve history, it will serve the revolution. And for Kessler, this was a, a horrendous totalitarian logic, that this idea of historical necessity will lead to basically the destruction of one's soul, it will lead to Stalinism. And he actually essentially abandons Marxism in the process of writing the book. And by the 40s, he's moving towards the Western camp. And he actually essentially changes sides. He becomes a member of the Congress of Cultural Freedom, which was funded by the CIA. He had contacts in the CIA. He was one of the main writers of a book called The God That Failed, which is a major anti-communist book published in 1950. So basically for Kessler, historical necessity was first represented by communism in the Soviet Union and later by capitalism in the United States. And if you kind of see, it's almost a mirror image because one side, you know, he just changes allegiance. He ends up in a strange place later in life where he abandons all of that and gets into weird like ideas of racial science and ESP. It's very strange where he ends up. In terms of responses to Kessler, the most there were members in the communist parties who answered him, but most of them were like, listen, they, they all confessed because, well, they were all guilty. So, and they just kind of did it, which really isn't convincing if you don't believe any of that. Uh, the most important person who did respond to him was a French philosopher named Merlis, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, um, who was not quite in the Communist Party of France, but was very close to it. And he's basically saying, he, he changes the idea of historical necessity to a wager. He's like, you know, we won't know if Stalinism leads to the future of humanity, of free from capitalism until, you know, the battle is ended. And he had kind of some arbitrary ideas on when that would be and conditions, because he's right. Remember, he's writing in like 1945. And he's like, well, if there's a war started, you know, the, the, and the USSR wants to expand, we'll show that that kind of doesn't work. So with the Korean War, he's like, that's it, we're done. And later in life, he kind of says, you know, Marxism and all revolutions will betray themselves in power. They'll end. So we need a third way of just kind of voting harder for reformists, et cetera. And just like Kessler, even though he had started on the opposite side, he's like, listen, historical necessity leads to totalitarianism. Now, with Western Marxism, I don't know how familiar everyone here is with the Western Marxist school, which isn't one school. It's a very diffuse uh, group of people. Some, like the Frankfurt School, are kind of organized, and some have, you know, they're very, and some are not involved in active politics, like the most of the Frankfurt School. Some are members of communist parties, like George Lukash 
Louis Althusser and Antonio Gramsci and some like Gramsci was the head of the Italian Communist Party. Another thing about um, Western Marxists is they tend to focus a lot more on writings on ideology, culture, and philosophy than, say, economics and history. That's not universally true, but it largely is. And the thing with Western Marxists is they have this very ambivalent relationship with Stalinism. On the one hand, you have it's very some they don't quite embrace it wholly, but they don't quite oppose it either. So you have someone like Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer, who are the two founders of the Frankfurt School. And in private, they are horrified at the Moscow trials. They're like, this is criminal. These people are innocent. But in public, they're like, we're not going to say anything because we're not going to embarrass the Soviet Union. And a lot of these people are in, uh, particularly Horkheimer and, and Adorno, they are exiles from Nazi Germany, and they see the Soviet Union as their hope. So they're not gonna, they don't want to embarrass that. Now, after 1945, they pretty much look at all, you know, both Western and um, the so societies in the Soviet Union as like, you know, having instrumental reason of dominating people. And they kind of, you know, retreat from all that, although they're kind of more or less in the Western camp for our purposes. You have someone like uh, Herbert Marcuse, who is never a Stalinist, never supported it, and, but... He did work for the OSS during World War II, which is the forerunner of the CIA. And he was very influential in the student movements. But even him, he basically saw that, well, yeah, I don't like Stalinism, but it's basically what else were they going to do? You know, was, that's the only option that they had. And he was looking for alternatives to the Western communist parties because he saw the working classes integrated in, into Western society. He said, well, the students, the outsiders, the poor, they'll kind of do it. And it kind of looks like this kind of libidinal revolt. You have others like Ernst Bloch, who's a great writer on Utopia. He he basically said during the Moscow trials, you know what, I'll actually write affidavits for the Soviet Union for the defendants so they could crush these traitors. As far as we know, the Soviets never took him up on that offer. Um, but he basically became an outright apologist for this. Although ironically, by the end of his life, he repudiated it. And his position on the Soviet Union essentially resembled Trotsky's, who he once called a traitor. So you have that. Others like Gramsci don't like Stalin's methods, but Gramsci is also in a very interesting position because he's in prison for the last 11 years of his life by Mussolini. And so he doesn't get quite a lot of information about what's going on, but he, he more or less critically supports what he knows about the Soviet Union. And, and but he, he never quite came around to this idea. You know, he never, as far as I know, he never said like Trotsky was in league with the fascists or anything like that. And some of these people have like suffer horrendous compromises. Uh, George Lukács, who's a great Marxist philosopher and was a leader in the Hungarian Soviet Republic of 1919, he was um, imprisoned at times under Stalin, and he was persecuted in Hungary by the New People's Republic. But he was essentially saying, "Listen, you know, the Moscow trials were right; these people were traitors, and they gave us a better chance of winning the war by getting rid of them." But even after Khrushchev's reforms, he's like, you know. We should try and reform things. Maybe there'll be some good bureaucrats who will do that. But he's like, we shouldn't actually rehabilitate their ideas, especially Trotsky. Doesn't like that. So you have all the, and you have Althusser, who's in a very weird position. He's a, a member of the French Communist Party, and he kind of has these kind of oblique criticisms, but he never does anything to risk expulsion. Sometimes he gets very vocal in his criticism, but he's like, you know, we should get rid of all this Stalinist stuff. And sometimes he's embracing Mao a bit. I mean, he's like, we should just go back to the era of the Popular Front from the 30s. So they really, none of these people have too much in terms of alternatives they're proposing. It goes from everything. Some of them are like, you know, let's just wait for an apocalyptic event. It'll just save us from capitalism. Let's look to this, some new outsider groups that will um, free us from, from capitalism. Some look for reforms. Some, like Eric Hobsbawm, they essentially, you know, they give up, but they have this nostalgic attachment to the Soviet Union. And even Hobsbawm, the great British historian, is like, you know what, if they had actually, if it doesn't matter how many they killed, if they'd actually reached communism, it would have been all justified. So the Western Marxists, and some of them make great theoretical contributions on whatever, like uh, Eric Hobsbawm's histories, Gramsci's writings from prison, et cetera. A lot of this is actually very valuable. But when it comes to understanding Stalinism, they, they have a lot of blind spots. And I don't think they quite understand it. 
And their relationship, depending on who we talk about, can be very complex. Now, the last is um, what I call the proletarian Jacobin school, and I'll try and make this fairly quick, is for the Russian revolutionaries, everyone who is a Marxist essentially is looking at the forthcoming Russian revolution through the prism of the French Revolution. You know, they see a similar situation, a decrepit old regime, a decrepit monarchy, and a new rising class, and they want to form a Jacobin-style party. And everyone, Martov, Lenin, Trotsky, uh, Plakhanov, they all are using this imagery of the French Revolution. Okay, I'm at 30 minutes. I will try and finish this up fairly quickly. And the Trotsky is essentially the one who takes it, uh, who develops an idea of looking at the French Revolution, like they're all looking at the, the Russian Revolution and seeing, you know, examples to follow, examples to avoid. So they, who's going to be Robespierre? Who's the Napoleon we need to avoid? And to make a long story short, Trotsky develops over time an, a, what I call proletarian Jacobinism. And it's basically understanding, you know, that there are material circumstances that led to the rise of Stalinism in the 1930s and 20s. And that he actually, Trotsky, despite the claims of the Western Marxists and members of the Communist Party, Trotsky actually had a full-fledged program of how you can avoid descending into Thimidor. And Trotsky's analysis of Stalinism in the 30s, he's looking at the fact that this is the economic isolation, the devastation of the Civil War, the atrophy of the Soviets, the decimation of the working class in Russia. And it leads to the rise of a new bureaucracy whose representative is Stalin. And that Trotsky says that this was actually historically unnecessary because Stalin, there, there were alternatives available and that Stalinism was actually this parasitic development on a collective property uh, basis. And that it has a nationalist ideology of socialism in one country, which is actually the antithesis of Bolshevik internationalism and you know, Soviet democracy. And Trotsky also says that Stalin is not like this kind of demonic figure, even though he clearly doesn't like him. He's like, if Stalin knew where his struggle against the opposition would lead, he would be horrified. So in a sense, Trots Trotsky says that Stalinism or Stalin is this unwitting agent of, you know, of, of betrayal. He doesn't quite, he thinks he's actually serving the revolution, but he's not. So what Trotsky is saying, to make the long story short, because I don't think people here quite need this lesson, is um, that Stalinism, there were not only alternatives available, but that Stalin was his and Stalinism was historically unnecessary, that there were these alternatives, and that even after, you know, Stalin consolidated power, that there was an alternative program to, you know, for the restoration of Soviet democracy. And then understanding Stalinism, we understand, first of all, there were progressive things about the Russian Revolution, you know, the nationalization of the means of production and the planned economy, et cetera. Those were real genuine advances, but they were threatened by this bureaucratic caste, and it was necessary to overthrow that. And I think if we actually, now to wrap up, is we can see that the historical uh, fatalists and the, the bolt from the blue and the historical necessity school, one group, you know, they're on opposite sides of the barricade, but they share the same underlying fatalism, teleology, they don't look you know, for alternatives. And they both see angels and demons as very mystical, it's very kind of religious at times. And it's not even that rational in their understanding of Stalinism. So it's kind of a unity of opposites, whereas I think Trotsky and particularly in the revolution to trade is like, listen, there are material circumstances in class struggle that lead to the rise of Stalinism, that there are alternatives, and we should understand that if this is the case, then Stalinism is not inevitable, that something else could have been in there. And that means for the future that we can actually conclude that communism and socialism don't actually need Stalinism, and therefore the possibilities for a non-Stalinist communism exist. Thank you for listening. <laughs>